All right, this morning we are going to be in Titus, but before we go to Titus chapter 3, I kind of want to read a few other passages this morning, so we'll be kind of doing a sword drill. We'll start over in Romans, familiar passage. I just want to, most of you know it already, but it's just a, a, a simple statement of our reality uh, without the Lord and before the Lord. 3 and verse uh, 23 there. It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then over in chapter 6 of Romans, picking it up in verse 17, we read, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For... When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Flipping over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and following. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Going over to Galatians. Flipping over to Galatians. And we want to look at chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which... I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, uh, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then looking uh, uh, down, well, we'll just stop right there on that one. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 2 real quick. 1 through 3, familiar text. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the, and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." Flipping over to Colossians real quick. Colossians chapter 1, 22 and following. Excuse me, 21 and 22. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death 
in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And then over to chapter 3 of Colossians verses 5 through 7. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Now, uh, over to Titus real quick and our text at hand. Chapter 3, verse 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Now here's, you may be asking the question, why the sword drill? What's this all about? Well, when you look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, he says uh, of, of, uh, in our Titus text, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. This is what these texts are all about, what I read to you. Uh, This is what we're looking at, a code of conduct. We're looking at a code of conduct in keeping with the truths that we have embraced, but specifically uh, in hand here, what's in view toward the unsaved, toward the unsaved. Now, how to get to that place mentally where that conduct is what is manifested naturally? We talked about it on Wednesday night. How do we get to the place where we live this, not because it's obligation, but because that's just the way we are. That's who we are. Christians t- tend more often than not, it seems of late, and as my, from my observation, we do the things we do because that's what Christians are supposed to do. But that's not how it ought to be. It ought to be who we are. It ought to be coming to the place where that's just what comes out of me. Not because it's supposed to, but because that's who I am. That's who you are. That's what we should all desire. And we're, we're, we're called to a pretty tall order here. When you look at what we're called to do as it relates to the unsaved, we're to submit to authority. We're to be obedient. We're to be ready for every good work. We're to malign no one. We are to uh, not be fighters, but we're to be peaceable. We're to be gentle, and we're to show every consideration for all men. Not just our brothers and sisters in Christ, but to everybody. This is who we are here. uh, we're We're to show that consideration to everybody. It is a tall order. It is a situation uh, that, that is difficult to do, especially when you're dealing with godless heathens who by their very actions, they, they fly in the face of everything that seems holy at times. And yet we're called to be and do these things. Act this way. Manifest these qualities to those people. The question is, is how do we do that? We have to remember Verse 3, for we also were, were foolish, ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasure, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. How do we get there? It starts by remembering that. You want it to come out of you naturally? Don't ever lose sight of who you were before Jesus, by His grace, made you who you are today. And you'll start manifesting to the lost the very things that He says ought to take place in our lives. That ought to be what we do. It can be natural, it should be natural. And it starts with remembering. The lesson we get here, your proposition, 
The believer is to remember that their own, excuse me, the believer is to remember their own past condition in order to properly relate with the unsaved in their condition. Let me say it again. The believer is to remember their own past condition in order to proper, properly relate with the unsaved in their condition. That's what we're learning here. What follows in our text here in this verse is a description of the believer before Christ, which makes this case uh, of, 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 of living it out, not living it out naturally, being able to get there by remembering who we are and who we were. So he gives us six features uh, in, or, uh, 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 in that description. There's six features to this description. So let's go ahead and let's look at this. Feature number one, verse three, we're told we were once foolish. We were once foolish. We played the world's fool. We were out here following after the world. The, the verse, if you notice, opens with the word for. The conjunction for, the gar gar. Conjunction. It's a gar clause. And again, what we're dealing with is an explanation as to the actions called for in verses 1 and 2. He's saying this is what ought to be happening and this is how you make it happen. This is, this is, let me explain why you should do these things. Why this should happen in your life as a believer. And, and it is this. And, and it's what we're looking at here. Also, he says we we were once. Who was? Who was the fool? Well, Paul's saying he was. Paul, Titus was. The Cretan believers. And by, by uh, way of the Holy Spirit, he's speaking to all of us. We all were foolish. And the, all of those verses I read that were leading into the, 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 the text today speak to that reality before the Lord. That's who we were. And this is what God has done to change that. He did it, by the way. That's the main thing to get. You didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I could have never done it. I'd, be, I'd still be a slobbering drunk probably. And it changed device. Chasing after whatever seemed to suit my pleasures at the moment. If it weren't for Jesus Christ and Him alone. And that's the fact. And by the way, it's the fact for every one of you here. And as soon as we get back to that reality, we'll, the sooner we get back to that reality, the sooner we'll start treating lost people as we should. When we understand that they're lost, they're fools, just like I was a fool. We're fo we were fools that side of Christ. Every one of us. I came at four years old. Well, you were a little fool. But we were all, all in the same condition. I was a fool. I know I was a fool. And many of you sitting here nod your head and you agree. You know you were a fool. We were fools. He says we once were, and that's the beauty of this. The idea, the idea is this was once our, my, your reality and yet it is now no more praise god praise god and everybody everybody here should have said that not just one person thanks larry you may have said it in your heart but it doesn't hurt to say it every now and then and say you know what thank you lord acknowledge the truth of god's word maybe you're not thankful that you're not in the same vomit we were in as peter put it like a dog returning to his vomit. That's what he described the old life. We've lost sight of that miserable mess we were in. It doesn't look so bad. And you know when it starts look, not looking so bad? It's because we let go of Jesus' hand and we've drifted from Him. And let's be serious about that. Jesus never went anywhere. He never changed, and the beauty of him never changed, and the grace of his, uh, the beauty of his grace hasn't changed. It's just as wonderful as the moment you trusted him and he saved your soul. What changed? We did. 
We've drifted. And the mess of the past starts looking a little better. Because we start remembering, well, you know, there's some fun things there. I'll go dabble in that mess again. And what you don't understand is the world is sitting there swinging a grappling hook, just waiting to throw it up there and get a hold of you and try jerking you back. So it can damage the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. It's all on us. We, we have to remember He is beautiful. And I was a mess. I was a fool. I played the fool. We played the fool. And He delivered us. And we have to come back to that. We also were once foolish. He tells us to remember it. You know what foolish is? Foolish is... It, it, it speaks of being without spiritual understanding in the context of Scripture, more often than not. You know, I look at, at people who are drunk and acting idiots and doing stupid things that no sane human being would do. And I'm not talking dangerous. I'm just talking about being stupid. People don't, just don't act that way unless they're just stupid. They're fools. We think of that. But it really speaks of the reality or the undergirding truth of being foolish is they have no spiritual understanding. They don't understand it. They don't get it. They lack the discernment of spiritual realities because of the darkness, the darkening effect of sin on their intellect. They do not see things clearly. Listen, I know you've asked this question because I ask it almost every time I watch the news anymore. Or I, or I hear something, I'm like, what? <laughs> How did they get there? You, you ask the question about their mental capacity, their, their ability to reason like a normal person where one plus one equals two. Where if you do this and you do this, it's going to result in this. And any sane, clear-thinking person sees that. But yet, it seems like the lost world can't add. Why is that? It's foolish. It's foolishness. They're, 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 they're made foolish in their mind. They, they don't have that ability to, to, to reach those conclusions. And here's the reality. We were once the fools too. You have to remember it. We have to remember it. When I look back, it's amazing this side of Christ, how foolish we, I was and how liberating the Lord is. You should thank God when you can sit and you can hear the mess that's put out here in the political discussion and in the world discussion, various issues we address, you should thank God when you can see it clear. Because it's the Lord who did that. It's the grace of God in your life that allows you to see that. I don't know what that means to you, but it, it's special to me, especially when you understand how foolish you once were in this world. Feature number two of this description, we were disobedient. And this goes hand in hand with foolishness, being foolish. This is, that, this is an evidence of that spiritually darkened mind. And what it is, when you're the fool, you willfully disregard authority. God's authority and even man's authority. If it works for me, I'll do it. I'm going to obey the law because I don't want to mess with the law. I don't want to go to court. <laughs> I don't want to face a judge. I don't want to be fine. But in reality, I could care less about that law. And if I could get by with breaking it, I'll break it. You say, well, that doesn't happen. People lie all the time on their income taxes. People subvert the law at every hand if it works for them. The lost person is prone toward that. Because the devil is, a, is disobedient. He, he, that's how he operates. And his children follow in, in kind. And so when we're on that side of the Lord, 
we're in that foolish realm, our minds can't think clearly, and what follows is our actions. And we become disobedient. Third feature is deceived, as it states there. For we also were foolish ourselves, disobedient, and we were deceived. We're deceived. This picture, this picture's active straying from the true course by following false uh, guides. What guides do we follow? Well, in this world, we follow Satan, his world system, and our, and our own flesh. Those are false guides. Now, I want to say something about this deception. This, to me, is one of the most saddest features of the description that we're looking at today. And, and I hope you can understand where I'm coming from when I, when I say this. The reason is that this is so sad is the true curse of being deceived. The true curse of deception is that in the, in the, the midst of the deception, in the midst of the deception, one feels that they're right. They feel they're right. And therein is the tragedy of the deception. Now I want to say that one more time so you get a, get a gist of this. The reason this is such a, a terrible thing is the curse of being deceived is that in the midst of the deception, as we're being deceived, as we've, as we've entered into the deception, we believe we're right. We believe we're right. And that is the tragedy of deception. Is that you have people out here and the way Satan works in people's minds on that side of Christ is he gets them to, to the place they'll fight and die for the lie. They believe they're right. But it's because of, of, of the foolishness that they've embraced that they exist under. It's the deception, and it's, that's the worst part of the deception. It's not just that you walk out of it and you feel like, oh, I got conned, I was deceived. No, we're talking about a whole worldview. We're talking about a whole system where these people, the lost person who we once were, we think we're okay, and that you're nuts. And you want to know something? That's exactly what's going on as it relates to you, the believer. You're the nut. You follow Jesus, you're nuts. You're crazy. You're a fool. That's exactly what they believe. And guess what? That's what we once believed. You say, well, I never got there. Well, in your heart you were there. You just didn't know it. You weren't able to process it. But I'm going to tell you, that's what's going on in the deception. Is what we, we think the deception is we think we're right in the lost condition. That they're the nuts. And in this world, that's how the script is being flipped. That's why we're being corralled into a, a smaller and smaller enclosing situation as a church. Especially churches that preach this book as the word of God. The noose is getting tighter and tighter and tighter on you. On me as the one who proclaims it and on you who believe it. It just is. They're seeing you more and more and painting you more and more as the fools of society. You're the problem. But that's where we were. Somebody getting in our business. It's my life. <laughs> I mean, we've heard that. It's my life. I'll do what I want with it. Well, that's that, that's, that's that mindset. That's that mindset. That's that deception. Next feature. I believe we're on feature four. Is that where we're at? Feature four, enslaved. This term speaks of bondage under a taskmaster. We see the lost of this world as willing participants, most of us. And that's a real problem. Because what happens is we take it personal. We do. And when we start taking everything personal, then we start painting the people as enemies. They're my enemy. They're lost. 
Satan has his hooks in them. They're deceived. They're fools to the world. The guides of the world, they follow. They're in a deception. They're lost. Maybe, maybe their situation can't be fixed, but it doesn't change what we ought to see as believers and their need. And the need is, is they need Jesus. They need what only Christ can give them. Only Christ can change that. If Christ shall set you free, you're free indeed. He can set them free. He can. They're enslaved. But oftentimes, we more often than not see them as willing participants. Well, they're going through life and it looks obviously that way. It does look that way. But in reality, they don't even realize that they're dragging chains. I didn't get it. I didn't understand that. You know, when Pastor Storm's sitting there and Jeff Hawkins is sitting there talking to me and Ed Culbertson and these guys coming up and witnessing to me while I'm out here chasing every pleasure, desire, whatever I was doing, what I was into, and they're sitting there telling me, man, don't you understand you're enslaved? That you're in chains? No, I'm doing what I want. Are you? Are you? And then they start appealing to your your, your condition, the fool, playing the fool, giving yourself into this power and that power in your life. And I'm telling you, when I laid my life down, and I'm sure for you too, it was so real, you could almost hear the chains hit the floor. Pilgrim's progress. Carrying that burden, that pack, his sin condition. Remember that? We watched the movie I remember sitting in the little church. We had a reel to reel, the reel to reel movies. <laughs> We're watching this old timey version of Pilgrim's Progress. I had just turned around and I'm watching him drag this bag, the weight, his sin, trying to do the right things in his flesh, trying to get right with God. He's even on the path, and it's not until he's climbing. And he realizes, I can't do this at all. Only Jesus can. And that bag fell off his back, rolled down that hill. And I'm sitting there watching that. And I was like, that's me. That's what's me. But you know what? That's every one of us. We are enslaved. They're lost people. These people... They may be enemies by their actions, but they're victims by the reality. They're in chains. They're deceived. And they're fools for the world. And we have to see them that way. That should be how we live before the lost. And I'm going to tell you, when we see them that way, they see Jesus. When we make them the only issue, then they see judgment. They see hater. They see all this ugliness. But when we see them as people enslaved, then Jesus can shine. Then Jesus starts looking really good. Because there's a difference. Because that's who they are. That's who they are. And they can see real difference. Feature five is self-destruction. or self, uh, They're self-destructive before the Lord. It's the, the, the way it's put here is if you look at it there in three. Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. That's, that's what they're enslaved to. Uh, just their own desires. They chase after those things. And, and the problem is, is uh, as they reach one uh, desire under the uh, in that when they finally reach it, they find out it comes up short, and then they're just driven to the next one, the next one, the next one. And I'm telling you, that's what the enslavement is. That's what's there. That's what's in the word. But then it's put spending our lives, and that's the self destruction here. The idea of spending our life. 
This is uh, usually one of the foremost regrets of people who come to Christ after having spent their lives. Time wasted. What I should, what I could have done, where I could be for the Lord, the time I could have spent in fellowship with the Lord. Time wasted. Wasted on what? Well, we've learned it's it's that self-destructive path. Destructive attitudes of malice and envy, as it's put here. Never finding satisfaction in personal pursuits. Uh, we, we harbor ill will and jealousy toward those who seem to reach those goals in their life. We look at, on that side of it, the people, and I'm going to tell you, this is very true. I, mean, I know it for a fact, because I've seen it. When you're on that side of Christ, anybody who's doing the right thing, they may say to you, I'm so glad you turned your right life around. You know, I'm so glad things are going good for you. But the minute you slip and fall, there's delight in their heart. And they'll be the first ones to put their arm around you and help you on back down the path in their direction. And you say, well, I don't know if that's the case. I'm telling you, it is. It is. Because they harbor ill will toward those who seem to have gotten out or gone someplace that they're not. Because when they're there, it convicts them of where they're at. And so if they falter, it justifies them in in a real way. That see, you see, you see what I'm saying? See where they're at? I knew it was coming, that kind of thing. Destructive attitudes, malice, envy. They envy those who seem to have reached it. And it's, it's, it's just a brutal, brutal cycle of self-destruction. The sixth feature is getting what you give. The NIV puts it this way. Being hated and hating one another. Being hated. This, this idea the, the, this, the, the, the idea behind this is uh, odious, re- repulsive, disgusting to others. I thought of a skunk in that regard. Very few people like a skunk. My sister did. She liked the smell of a skunk. And she always said that. It always bothered me. I'm like, I'd really like to catch one and put it on her windowsill and see if she really... <laughs> But she always said she liked skunks. That was her thing. And uh, she loves skunks. But skunks stink. They, they, they can stink. And most people treat skunks with disgust. They're repulsed by, by a skunk. And guess what a skunk does in turn? He gives what he gets. You treat him with disgust and hate. Just like the lost person, they're hateful, and what comes back to them is hate. They can't get there. The world offers superficial icing stuff, and it melts under the, under the light of reality because it's really not love. I thought I was loved by all my friends until I turned around for Christ. And then I realized they really weren't as good of friends as I thought they were at all. And I thought, Lord, I don't have any friends. And then the Lord let me keep Jeff. Gave me Rusty. Gave me Ed. Jeff Hawkins. Eric Peterson. Dave Scott later. I mean, gave me friends. Who love me and love the Lord. And I love them and I love the Lord. And I love the Lord loving them. And I love when good things happen for them and they grow. And my friends that he's kept giving me, Milo and all of you, Mark, all of you guys, we're friends. He gives us more and more and more. Larry, all all of us, all all the people that he floods in your life. And that's just the guy friends. I'm not going to keep going and get myself in trouble. But you're, where we become, he gives us more. He gives us good things. But on that side of the coin, we're hated 
We're hateful and we get hate in return because we become more and more ugly the longer we stay in that bondage. And I'm going to tell you, look at the world. Look at the world. The, long, the, 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 the stronger we, ref, we refuse the truth of the Word of God, and I'm talking culturally now. And by the way, I don't think the culture is going to fix this world. No president's going to fix this world. It's not going to happen. Can we get seasons of great, you know, uh, seasons of good things happen? Sure we can. And we can get bad, one, bad presidents, good presidents, they come and go. But I'm going to tell you, they're not going to fix anything. What's going to fix everything is Jesus. And ultimately, when he comes back, he's going to really fix it. But, but, but the reality is, is this world, this world reflects, the longer we stay away from God, we see a greater ugliness. And I think we're seeing it more and more in, in our part of the world. And we're living, the, and by the way, we live in the best place you can live, I believe. We live in America. We're free. Praise God. I mean, as, even with our ills, we're still blessed. With abundance, with freedom. I don't know how long it's going to last, but the reality is we keep pushing God away in obvious arenas. Pushing Him. Pushing Him. Pushing Him. Pushing Him. And then we start bringing in the very things that are abominations to Him. And we say, this is right. This is right. You're going to embrace this. You're going to do this. You're going to act this way. You're going to speak this way. You're going to do these things. You're not going to speak about this. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. And it just gets uglier. It gets uglier and gets uglier. And the world gets more hateful and hurtful and more blatantly in that regard. We see it. Because they give what they get. And the believer, we should be we should be on the opposite end of the spectrum. Even in the midst of the most ugly circumstances, what they ought to get from us is an understanding that they're lost. And I was there. I was there. And when we see it that way, then we'd start changing maybe one individual. Somebody gets saved. Somebody changes their life and starts walking again with the Lord because you care about them. Because you meet them with kindness and understanding of who you were before the Lord. That's who I was. Do you think that way? Do I think that way? And I'm going to tell you, in this world today, more and more we have to be reminded that's how I ought to think. And what, what, I, what I would love to see happen in my own life and in your lives is it's just where I am with Jesus. And it starts with going back to where I was without Him. You lose that. And I'm going to tell you something about being odious. It hit me. I was driving into town. Going over this in my mind, this message. I'm all by myself today. I, I drove in because Sophie's sick. And Reddit said, I'll drive in so I can go home. And, I, and I'm driving in. I was thinking about this whole odious deal and the, the, the skunk and all that. And I said, you know, the reality is, is the most odious people in the world who are their believers, who've lost sight of who they were before Jesus. And they start thinking that God has done himself a big favor by saving me. Those are the most stinking people on the planet. You don't want to live there. I don't want to live there. I want to be like Paul. I don't ever want to get over the grace of God in my life. Help me remember those chains. Not to wear them again, but to remember that was my reality. And you know what? That's the reality of every person out there who's lost. It's God's call to save who He's going to save. He's going to have to make that call. But my, my obligation before the Lord is to, to, to be a light for Jesus Christ. And it starts... To this lost world, it starts by, me, by my remembering who I was before the Lord.
and I'll start treating people the way they ought to be treated. That's how it should be. There should be an obvious difference in us in this world. We're, in, we're getting close to Christmas. I can't even believe it. I'm telling you, the older you get, I'm, Jeff always said it, the closer you get to dying, the faster the years fly by. <laughs> He said, when you're, when you're just really super young, a year seems like a, a year's forever. You just, ah, you can't, you want to, I want to be this old. I want, the, you know, the next deal that doesn't seem to happen fast enough. And now I'm trying to pull it back, rein it back, because it's just like it just keeps going and going. But back to my point where we're at. It's Christmas time, and I have a favorite show, and I don't know if it's yours, and, and I really don't care because it's one of mine. <laughs> But it is, it is the Christmas carol. It is the Christmas carol. And it was Rogers, one of Rogers' favorite too. But it's not just any Christmas carol. It's got to be Alistair Sims' Christmas carol. He's the actor. I love that story. But I love him in that role. But you know the story, and I'm drawing from the storyline to make a point here. Ebenezer Scrooge, we all know who he was. That The story unfolds him. This guy was an ugly human being. He truly was. Uh, he was hard. He was uncaring. Uh, he had no compassion whatsoever. He was rich and he was tight. And uh, he didn't care who died, who passed. It didn't mean anything to him. It didn't mean anything to him. He was all about himself and his wealth. But on Christmas Eve, he was visited, if you remember the story, by three spirits, past, present, and future. And they revealed who he was. This is who you were, they, 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 his past, who he had become, and how he was going to end. That was what they did for him. They, they laid this bear. I believe that when he wakes up that morning on Christmas, I think he got saved. That's what I say. Whether he did or not, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, the change that was wrought happens with people getting saved. And I, I love it when he gets saved and he's dancing like a drunken man and his maid. I love the whole thing. I just grin and laugh every year, watch it every year, enjoy it just as much as the year before. Love it. And I, I, I watch that and, and he changes. He changes completely. He cares about people. He cares about his employees, Bob Cratchit. Cares about Tiny Tim and the entire family. He ministers to them. We're told he becomes the second father to them. He becomes one of the greatest figures, personalities in, in what they say, merry old London. He becomes a, a great businessman who is generous to a fault. He changed. That's who he was. That's who I was. And when you understand who you were and what the Lord did for you, you'll start treating those lost people differently. But you have to keep that before you. We should not lose sight of the grace of God in our lives. Remember, such were some of you. That's who I was. I was these things. You were these things. And when we keep that in perspective, then we as individuals, but even as a corporate body, we're going to have an impact upon a lost world because we're going to see them differently and we're going to treat them differently. And it's hard in our time. It's hard for us to get there because I know it's you almost feel like shelling up with just believers and, and the, the, the world can go to hell in a handbag. Literally. But the reality is, is until the Lord takes you out of here and me out of here, He said, I'm going to save people. And I ought to care about that. We ought to care about that because such were some of us. Let's keep it in mind. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word today. And I pray that the message that we looked at today would really resonate in our hearts and that we would really get a hold of that we have a place in this world and a time to serve. But if we're going to reach the objective, your purpose for us as individuals and as a church, we can't lose sight of who we were before you because it's because of what you've done for us that will cause us 
to care about the lost and this world and to live in such a way in this lost world that you shine. That people see you. And that's what we want, Lord. I thank you for this little letter. Pray that you continue to bless as we move through it, that we grow through the study of it. And uh, I, I just thank you for each one who's out today. I do pray you bless what remains of this day. Uh, Club ministries tonight, may you be in all of that and impact lives, young lives for your glory. Be with our leaders in a special way too, Lord. And then bless any fellowship we would enjoy one with another today. But help us, Lord, in the week ahead to just really, really give true and deep consideration for what we're looking at here. Uh, and may it change us as we see the lost. And may we be used of you to, to, to reap that harvest that you're yet all about, Lord. But just bless uh, the week ahead. And we just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.